good morning, everyone. Welcome to Olive Branch. Thank you for fighting the fog out there to be here today. Um, Pastor Wayne and Sarah and Johnny and Christian have all gone up to Chicago to see Ashley. So the whole family is uh, getting together for a week to uh, hang out, see the sights of Chicago. I've been to Chicago, I think, one time. And it was not like the Ferris Bueller movie at all. Uh, but I guess I just had really high hopes for it. So um, continue to pray for them that they have a safe trip. I know once they're done in Chicago, they're going to go visit some friends uh, from a previous church in Ohio. And so they will be back with us uh, this coming Sunday. I've got a couple of announcements to share with you all this morning. Hopefully, if my clicker works. It might. might not. There we go. All right, if you are a guest, and this is... Ah, if this is your first time, I'm sorry. There we go. If you are a guest, we are glad that you are here. Uh, on the back table, we have Connect Cards, which is our way of you, know, you knowing us a little bit better and us knowing you a little bit better. Uh, we also, on the back of your bulletin, have a mobile version where you just scan the little QR code. We also still have guest gift bags. Um, first time, second time, uh, talk to a pastor, deacon. I guess I'm the only pastor here today. Uh, talk to me, talk to a deacon, usher, and we will hook you up with a good little gift bag that tells you more about Olive Branch. Women on Mission is meeting today at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. And this coming Thursday is the women's and men's breakfast because we had to cancel last Thursday's because of the storm. That is happening uh, this time at the normal time. Talk to Matt and Shirley Clark for more details on that. This is the exciting news that we get to share with you all today. So the uh, process of getting the sanctuary renovated uh, was taking a little bit longer than what uh, we were hoping, mainly because of just the uh, lack of supplies coming in, like foam for uh, redoing pews, all this kind of fun sort of techno stuff, uh, technical stuff. So next Sunday, we will not be in here. We're going to move up to the sanctuary. We'll be meeting up there for both services. So where will you not be next week? In here. So we'll be back up at the sanctuary. So, yeah, that's exciting. I'll clap for that. I missed the sanctuary. So we'll be back in the sanctuary. And also, Lord willing and Sam willing, uh, YC for this week will be happening also up at the sanctuary. We're going to call it our little test run to see what blows up up there. So uh, middle high school, don't come here. Go up there for this Wednesday. Uh, also, we are still updating the church picture directory. If you've had any information changed or any... Uh, picture that you want uh, updated, like if it's a 15-year-old photo, you probably want to change that, uh, just so we can recognize who you are. So get that into the church uh, office by the end of July. There's details in the bulletin. And then last but not least, on August 4th during YC, uh, we will be having a middle and high school end of summer bash at uh, the Parsonage across the street. So there'll be games and food and uh, slip and slides and water balloons and all that fun stuff. So uh, middle and high schoolers, if you are watching this or in here, um, go there on August 4th. So other than that, I think that's everything. I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we're going to continue to worship together. So let's pray. Father, we're glad that we can be in your house. We're glad that we can worship a, a mighty and holy God. I just pray that you bless the time together that we are going to uh, spend worshiping you and spend uh, with your word. We love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Claudia. Um, so kids, for our children's time today, I have a, I guess it's, it's, it's almost going to be like a show and tell where you just kind of tell. And I, I don't know what to expect from it, but that's okay. Do any kids, and well, let's go with this. Does one kid want to come up and tell us, tell us of a time when they made a mistake? Anyone want to tell us? It can be a funny mistake. It can be a not so funny mistake. I can't guarantee that your parents won't ground you if you tell this mistake. But they're in church, so we're going to hope and pray for grace and mercy. Landon, you look like you've got some stories to tell. You want to try it? No? All right. Well, how about this? I'll tell you all this one time. Uh, and this is all going to relate here. Um, of, of what I think is a pretty big mistake that I made in the past, um, at our old church, and I know I've shared this story, I think, a few times. At our old church, uh, we would go to summer camp every year. And uh, this was, I think, the first year that I was going. And we had some, some bus troubles, so we, we rented a couple vehicles, so we had to put less kids uh, in, less, in more vehicles, if that makes sense. And so uh, I book a camp, that, or I book the tickets for the camp. Everything's going good. Uh, we get on the road, and we're driving up towards Atlanta in Georgia. And I go this exit, and my other people, my other leaders and my other kids, keep going straight. And I think, well, we'll meet up somewhere. And uh, we get to this part where we stop for lunch. I ask, where are you guys at? They say, oh, we're stopping for lunch, too. Great. Let's, uh, our GPS says we'll be there in this amount of time. Our GPS says the same thing. OK, cool. We're probably going to the same spot. We drive, and we get to this camp. They have a, like a children's youth camp going on. So I think, oh, yeah, this is it. This is the college camp we're supposed to be at. Um, my other youth leader calls me and says, hey, Brady, we're at the camp. Where are you? And I say, oh, we're here too. Where are you at? What do you see? And I say, well, I see a lot of hills. I see some brick buildings. I see a sign that says, uh, what, Knoxville University, something like that. And there's silence on the end of the phone. And she says, oh, sweetie, you're at the wrong camp. And I go, are you sure? Because I think, no, there's no way. How many youth conferences can be happening in Tennessee at this time of year? Apparently a couple. Um, so I look at the GPS, and apparently I am three hours away from where I'm supposed to be with a bunch of high school boys. And so we drive, we stop to McDonald's, we get there probably 6, 7 o'clock. But would you know, I did not make that mistake again. So here's where I'm going with this. I think we can all admit that at some point in our lives, we have made mistakes, right? Can, let's be honest. If you have ever made a mistake, raise your hand. Everybody makes mistakes. But there is one person who has never made a mistake. Who do we think that is? Jesus. Yes, Jesus lived a completely perfect life. Do you know how hard it is to live a completely perfect life? Very hard, because you all just said I've made mistakes. But Jesus says, no, I am perfect in all of my ways. He has done what we could not do. In order for Jesus to be our Savior, he had to live a perfect life. That means no sin, no mistake, no error. And because he did that, he is able to be our Savior. And so that is what we can remember, is that uh, even when we make mistakes, we serve a God who never makes mistakes, who is perfect and righteous and holy in all his ways, and that is good because we are not able to do that. So kids, remember, you're not perfect. That's okay. We can serve a God who is totally perfect. I'm going to pray real quick, and then Sarah is going to come up here and play one of my favorite hymns on the flute. So let's pray again real quick. God, we are so thankful that we serve a perfect and righteous and holy God. You have done what we are incapable of doing, and we thank you for that, and it's in your son's name that we pray, amen.
Psalm 19, 7 through 11 this morning. And I'm going to take us through a little bit of a church history lesson. They say when you, uh, if you're a pastor while you're in seminary, all you do is just kind of reteach the things that they're teaching you there. And I hope that's not the case, but I'm in a church history class right now, and I haven't gotten to the Reformation yet, but uh, next week I guess is when I'm supposed to get there. So back in 2017... Uh, the church or Christians around the world, they celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And so some will say that the Protestant Reformation is one of the most important events in Christianity of the past 500 years. And so what a lot of people consider to be the event that, that kick-started the Reformation was the hammering of the 95 Theses by Martin Luther on the door of Wittenberg Castle back in 1517. Now, regardless of if it was uh, Luther or if it was a student of Luther or a friend who actually hung the theses on the door, uh, that's kind of been wondered about if it was actually Luther or not. We know that on October 31st, 1517, the 95 theses of Martin Luther were hung on to the castle door, and it has changed the course of Christianity in a remarkable way. Uh, back in 2017, at the anniversary, the 500th anniversary, uh, my students and I, we, yet a, we led a youth service, and we uh, talked about uh, what the Reformation stood for, and kind of like the main doctrine or teaching that came out of it, um, by referring to uh, five important things known as uh, sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, solos Christus, and soli dio gloria. So for my non-Latin speakers... Uh, scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Now, these five statements were central to the doctrines that were being rediscovered in the Protestant Reformation. And so I bring this up because this year, 2021, is another important anniversary. It is the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Worms. And so it looks like it says Diet of Worms. Uh, that was not a different kind of keto diet back then. It is a very fancy thing of saying the Diet of Worms. Verms. So, uh, in 1521, Emperor Charles V um, assembled on behalf of the Catholic Church what is known as the Imperial Diet. And at this Diet, uh, Martin Luther was summoned to the city of Worms, where he was told that he must either renounce or affirm the views that he had preached about over the past few years of his life, of, of him being active in ministry and the things that he was writing. Um, Pope Leo X, he issued what is known as a papal bull, which is a decree that is issued by the Pope. And the Pope claims to have found 40, over 45 errors uh, within the writings of Luther. So Luther, he agrees to uh, go to, this, to the Diet of Worms on account of one thing. He has to be promised safe passage to and from the assembly. On April 16, 1521, Luther arrives at Worms, and he's told that he would appear before the council the next day. On April 17th, Luther appears before the council, and Johann von Eck, who was the presiding officer over the council, asked Luther if he was indeed the author of the number of books that they had laid before Luther, and uh, basically said, is this uh, what you're teaching, and if this is true, if this is really you, are you willing to basically admit to being a heretic? Now, this is a pretty big request, so what Luther does is he asks to have some time to pray about it and to think about it, so they give him till 4 o'clock the next day. At 4 p.m., April 18, 1521, Luther comes before the council and he says that he would not renounce what was written unless he could be proved by Scripture that he was wrong. And from that moment, we get what has probably gone down in history is the most famous words that Martin Luther ever spoke. It's been in movies, it's been uh, written about, there have been conferences that have built themselves over these words. And what Luther said was, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. At this moment, sola scriptura, or scripture alone, becomes one of the battle cries of the Reformation. So when we talk about scripture alone, what we mean is that the Bible is the sole infallible inspired source of authority for the Christian faith. 
This means that the Bible is totally sufficient for every need that we have in life. Everything that we truly need to know, we can know through the Word of God. So R.C. Sproul, he said that Scripture is infallible and inerrant because it comes to us by the superintendence of God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible is inspired in the sense that its author ultimately is God. Even though it is transmitted through human writers, the ultimate source of its truth and its content comes from God. And God, of course, is infallible. I am concerned in a way that we have lost sight of the importance of what Martin Luther was fighting for. We have uh, lost sight of the, the grandeur and the majesty of Scripture. And I wish I had brought my Bible up here because that book is the most important book in the entire world throughout history. No other book can touch what the Bible has Done. There will never be a time where it is not the most important book in the world. So have we, as the church, lost sight of the glory of God as it is revealed in Scripture? Charles Spurgeon, he said that half of our fears arise from neglect of the Bible. And that's a pretty big statement today. Half of our fears arise from neglect of the Word of God. So what I want to do, Lord willing today, is, is kind of stir up this this heart for the Bible, that where we look at, at the Bible on, on our bookshelf or our night, nightstands, wherever it is, uh, hopefully not gathering up dust, but when you look at the Bible, you just say, wow, that is the word of God almighty. And to think that, that he has revealed himself in this word to us. So I'm hoping that by, by the end of the day, we're not just in love with scripture, we're in love even greater and more deeply with the God that has breathed it out and inspired it. Luther fought for the preeminence of the word for the common man at his time. And we should join in that fight too, of where we fight and give all that we can to dive into the scripture, to breathe them in, to bring them out. Did you know that, that the uh, concept of us as the, the common people of the church, it was very rare until about the time of Luther that the word of God was accessible to the congregation members. It was all just uh, bishops or, or pastors. They were the only ones that could handle it, and they were always handling it in, in Latin, and it's all confusing, because who speaks Latin anymore? Nobody. I've always been afraid if I try to learn Latin, I'm going to end up like conjuring up a demon because I said one wrong syllable or something. That's how crazy Latin is. But uh, the Bible, they have fought for centuries now that we could hold on to this book and be inspired by the God who has breathed it out. And so here we are now, needing to fight for this book. So I want us to look at Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Here's what David says. He says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warmed or warned, and keeping them there is great reward. What David is saying here, and what I think we kind of do is uh, we need to sort of slow down as we look at, at these verses. If we read too quickly, we're going to miss out on what we are trying to accomplish today. We're going to miss out on the long-term application of what it really means to look at the Word of God. So when David says that the law of the Lord is perfect, I think that we might, at some of us maybe have this idea of being like, now hang on, Brady, uh, the law, I, I, I know my, my, my Old Testament, the law is just the first five books of the Bible. At David's time, all they had was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, Here's where we're going with it. When the law, we read that the law is perfect, there's two things that at least that we need to remind ourselves. The first is this. The law of God was given to man so that man would follow the Lord. The law says in order for you to be most satisfied in your life, you need to follow the Lord faithfully. The law shows us what is required of us. God requires us to be perfect, but our sin has so far removed us from that standard that we are incapable on our own works and our own deeds to ever obtain 
perfection. So one thing that makes the law perfect is that it shows us our total inability to save ourselves. It shows us that, hey, we are all on level ground. We all need to do something. God needs to do something in order to save us or else we are toast. This thing, the law does not just whisper uh, to us that, that we have, have fallen a little bit short of the glory of God. The law doesn't just uh, say, hey, you kind of made a mistake here. You might want to work on that. The law doesn't do it. The law does not whisper of our need. Instead, what we see through the law is the Holy Spirit with this like righteous megaphone saying, y'all need some Jesus. Like, y'all need to get the gospel. So at the time of the law, salvation is still by faith alone. It's not like Jesus uh, shows up and says, hey, here's this whole new concept of salvation. Uh, it has always been, it always has been by faith that we are saved. So what the law does is it shows us that we need a Savior. And Paul recognizes this in Romans 7. Paul writes, then what then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that proved life proved death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Do we hear what Paul, Paul's saying at this point? He's saying if it's not for the law, which is holy and righteous and good, how would he and how would us as the future church know of our need for a Savior? If it's not for what God has given through the law, through the Old Testament, how would we have known that we are in desperate need of the gospel? The law is perfect because it shows us God's ultimate righteousness. It shows his complete holiness and just how far removed we are from it. And so, uh, Paul continues this thought in Galatians 3. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. The law exists, and I've said this a little bit already, the law exists so we can see how far removed we are from God. The law exists to to uh, magnify God's infinite holiness, his infinite righteousness, and our total inability to save ourselves. Because unless we are made aware of how far we have fallen, we are not going to realize that we need to get up. And so Martin Luther, uh, going back to him, he has one of the best commentaries on any book of the Bible. It's his commentary on Galatians. And so there's this really long quote, but uh, it needs to be shared, because it really, not only does it kind of capture a lot of what he was standing for at the Deed of Worms, it's important for us to remember as well. So here's what he says. He says, For God, seeing that this universal plague of the whole world, that is man's opinion of his own righteousness, his hypocrisy and self-delusion, could not be beaten down by any other means, he would that it should be slain by the law. Not forever, but that when it is once slain, man might be raised up again above and beyond the law, and there might hear this voice. Fear not, I have not given the law and killed thee by the law, that thou shouldst abide in this death, but that thou should fear me and live. For the presuming of good works and righteousness stands not with the fear of God, and where the fear of God is not, there can be no thirsting for grace or life. God must therefore have a strong hammer to break the rocks and hot burning fire in the midst of heaven to overthrow the mountains, that is to destroy this furious beast, that when a man by this bruising is brought to nothing, he should despair of his own strength, and being thus terrified, should thirst after mercy and remission of sins. When... So what, what we see with this here, what, what Luther is saying, is to break the solid mountain that is sinful man's heart, God must use the hammer of the law to break through. In order to get through it, like, like here's the thing. Before you came to Christ, y'all were as stubborn, and I was as stubborn against God as you could possibly be. It would be easier for you to punch through a mountain than for you to save your own sins. God, doing that work, he breaks the hard shell of human heart to expose the needs of the man. 
The second thing that I kind of want us to look at is how Christ came to fulfill the law and how he said that not a single word, jot, or tittle would pass away. Peter, he would later in 2 Peter 3 put Paul's writings on the same level as the Old Testament scriptures. So all of this is just to say that when David says that the law is perfect, we can confidently say it is not just the first five books of the Bible that are perfect, the entire canon of scripture is perfect. It's all breathed out by God. It is sufficient. It is good for, for teaching, training, rebuking, all the beautiful things that Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But God does not just stop at saying that the word of God is perfect. He continues to say that it revives the soul. For all of us that are subject to the word of God, our lives are totally transformed. There is not a single book on your bookshelf that can claim that. There's not a single book in Barnes and Noble or Books a Million or in the Library of Congress that can say, I can change you like the Bible can. That is solely belonging to the Word of God. What other book can claim to have that level of man-altering, history-changing, soul-saving power of the Word of God? There isn't a single one. There's none. And so Spurgeon, he said that when the law drives and the gospel draws, the action is different, but the end is one. For by God's Spirit, the soul is made to yield, and cries, turn me, and I shall be turned. Try men's depraved nature with philosophy and reasoning, and it laughs your efforts to scorn. But the word of God soon works a transformation. The book of the Lord is a life-altering book. Every word in the pages of Scripture can change the life of man for the better. Not only is the testimony of God, which is found in Scripture, a sure and steady place to put our feet, it makes the simple wise. Someone with the IQ of a rotten banana that relies on the Word of God and has saving faith in Christ is wiser than some of the most gifted scientists and alleged geniuses in the world. And how do we know this? Well, the Bible says that uh, the man that denies God, the atheist who denies God's existence, is a fool. In the eyes of God, if you rely on his word and have faith in Christ, you are wiser than all the Richard Dawkins, Stephen Hawkins, Neil deGrasse Titansons, and Bill Nye the Science Guys put together. Do you know what has really just, just kind of blown my mind? And I tried to explain it to the students a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know how, how well it worked. Have you ever noticed how one of the most important things, something that seems as complex as the salvation of sinners, the gospel, how it can be explained by a child? Like, if, if you were to ask, you know, a, a five-year-old who has been uh, kind of led by his parents in the church, who, who knows uh, of the gospel and the word of God, if you were to ask them, how, how are you saved? They, they'll probably say by Jesus Christ. Something as complex, allegedly, as the gospel, the most important thing that we can know, a child can explain. What else is like that in the world? And we think that we need greater and greater and greater knowledge. But the thing is, if we really want to make a significant impact in any way at all, anything that has eternal change, it's not necessarily going to be because you got a really good SAT score. It's going to be because you took the message of the gospel and you ran with it. You said, this is what Christ has done for me. I'm going to go and I'm going to change the world through the power of the gospel. Have you ever thought about how the story of scripture, the gospel, it is perfect for every single person in the world? Here's, and here, here's what I mean. Jesus did not come to this earth as a king. He didn't come as, as this shining, you know, uh, all-powerful king, this go around, next time, be different. He didn't come as a king, he came as what? He came as a baby. He came as a suffering servant. If he came as a king, then only the uh, regal and prestigious might be interested in him. Jesus didn't come as a rich man, he was homeless, he was a carpenter. If Jesus came as this prestigious being, he might be perceived as only for those that have a lot of things. We see that Jesus suffered, and if he never did, where would be all of the hope for those that are suffering? Tim Keller, he expands on that. He says, what if Jesus had come as a philosopher with great intellectual system of thought? Then the only people helped by him would have been the intellectuals. What if he had led a powerful movement of moral teaching with himself as the living example? Then only the people strong, able, and accomplished enough to imitate him would have benefited. But across both history and nations of the world, we have seen people from all classes and conditions finding peace and power in the gospel of Jesus. Poor people do not gather in homes to discuss Plato or Aristotle, but they do to study and talk about the message of Jesus, and their lives are changed by it. The beauty of 
Jesus Christ is that no one can say that he is totally unrelatable to them. There is something in Jesus that can draw every single person in the world to him, something that we see that he has that we are incapable of having, something that we want, we can look to him and see he's got it. Before we go too much further, I want you to uh, kind of ask yourself something, kind of think about something. It's 940. I got up here, I think, at 925. 15 minutes, we've talked about one verse. Just one verse out of all of them. Now, this ain't saying we're going to be here till 11 o'clock. I ain't scaring you that, but this is where I'm, where I'm going with this. We've been looking at one verse, one part of what David has said. And we're not just like, like grasping at straws, hoping to get something that is like makes sense to us. Like I think we're getting good stuff. I wrote the sermon, so I'm hoping it's good stuff. But like we're getting stuff that makes sense. We're getting refreshing stuff for the soul. And now this is not uncommon when it comes to Scripture. Scripture comes alive when we take the time and we just look at it. And so I did this exercise a while back, right before the pandemic started, and I told the kids, Hey, uh, for 10 minutes, I want you to look at one verse in the Bible. And, I, and we did like John 3, 16. I want you to look at one verse and just, just follow the Spirit. See where it takes you. See what kind of comes to your heart, comes to your mind, what the Lord is revealing to you. And so uh, they, they, I told them to do it. See what happens. I, uh, before that day, I was like, I'm going to do this. I want to see what happens. For 10 minutes, I looked at John 3, 16. And in those 10 minutes, over 25 things popped out of that verse that I felt like the Lord was making known to me. And this is one verse of the Bible. If I had 20 minutes, I'd probably find even more. So this is where I'm going with this. Try this at home. I've, I've had students ask me, how do, you, like, how do you read the Bible? I mean, it's just it's so much. Like, you know, I, I think we kind of get this mindset of if we have these Bible reading plans where we have, like, uh, you know, read 20 chapters in the morning, 35 chapters at night. Like, that's overwhelming. But just slow it down. Take four or five verses. And just and just just re, just just let it all in, just kind of breathe it in. You know, that's what God has given us the word for. Is not not that it would totally overwhelm our systems, but so that we can bring it in and it be useful. And so you know, yeah, read chapters of the Bible, but slow it down. Just breathe it in. Just see what the Lord is revealing to you, because one verse for ten minutes could radically change your life. Could just totally change you. So let's jump ahead for verses 10 through 11. Um, David, to go back to, he says that the laws more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Is that how you feel when you approach the Bible? Do you find the words of Scripture, the commands of God, to be more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey? Spurgeon said that the pleasures arising from a right understanding of the divine testimonies are of the most delightful order. Earthly enjoyments are utterly contemptible if compared with them. The sweetest joys, yes, the sweetest of the sweetest falls to the portion of him who has God's truth to be his heritage. I'm gonna, I'll share a little testimony of, of my own, I guess, Bible reading. Um, I love expository, verse-by-verse -verse studying and, and preaching of the word of God. I, I love going verse by verse in teaching. And so um, one of the things that I actually worry about from time to time is uh, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm hoping I got at least 60 to 70 years left. What am I going to do if I don't get to teach every single verse in the Bible? Because that's what I want to do. I want to do that. And uh, I mean, I realize that, you know, the alternative is far better, but um, this book is a gold mine. I told Laura a couple weeks ago, I, I finally am starting to feel like I know what it is to really love the Word of God. Like, I'm, I'm excited to read this book. Like, I'm excited to, to share this, this book. And, and every time I'm up here, every time I step up to a pulpit or a music stand or whatever it is, I'm like, I get excited. Because this is what it's like. It's like, I feel like I'm that kid on Christmas that gets up and he gets his presents and he gets to open up and he's like, wow, look at all this amazing stuff. I study the Word of God as I present it to you, to students. I'm like that kid at the beach with a metal detector that, that, that is just going back and forth. And he's just excited because he's getting little beeps and he, gets, he finds this thing of tremendous value. And I'm just like, hey, look what I found. Look what's in here. And, and the difference between the kid with the metal detector and the almost 27-year-old uh, is that I'm not finding bottle caps. I'm finding gold. 
in the word of God. I get to bring before you and, and my heavenly father something incredible because I'm, I'm, I'm diving into the word and I'm just, just seeing so much of what God has done. And it's not like I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, here's this God of bygone ages. This is the God of now. Everything that I'm seeing in this book, it's like the same God that's here is, is doing amazing things right now. This gospel that is here, it's the same gospel. And I love the word of God. So what I want to do with a little bit of time we have left is give you four applications, four truths uh, that I think we as believers need today when it comes to the word of God. So application number one is this. Christians that hold on to the truths of Scripture will not be swayed by the things that go against it or go against the things of Christ. Now, you don't need me to tell you that we live in a dark world, not just because it's foggy and cloudy out, but because, hey, we have a fallen and sinful world. You don't need me to tell you that uh, from some viewpoints, the world is becoming significantly less Christian in terms of morality, even though man in his fallen nature has always been like that. See, in Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, it says that the Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man, to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. I think something we need to kind of, with this in mind, we're not necessarily living in any time in history that is less God-fearing or more God-fearing than any other point. People say that things are going to get worse before they get better, and I think that's true in a sense. But I don't think you can get less God-fearing or less God-honoring than what you see here in Psalm 14 and Romans 1 through 3. You just can't. We worry about this day when the Antichrist comes. But the thing is, he's always been here. 1 John 2.18, it says, Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that, Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was uh, trying to describe what, he, what this verse means. He says that the whole period from the coming of our Lord and especially from his death and resurrection and ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the whole of the period from that until his final return is the last hour. The last hour is sometimes used to cover the whole era, the whole epoch that lies from the finished work of Christ until his ultimate return in glory. Later on in 1 John, uh, he says, "...and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God." This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. You see, the spirit of the Antichrist is everything that goes against Jesus Christ. Christians that have the word of God as the foundation of what they'll do will not be easily swayed by the lies of the world and the lies of the devil. So here's the thing. If, if your eye is constantly on the world, if it's constantly on, on other opinion of you and just kind of like, you know, being friends with society, culture, just kind of keeping up to date with it, and, you know, Jesus is, like, over here, and, but you're looking this way, you're not going to be faithful. You're going to stumble because you're more concerned with all of this than keeping your eyes on the glory of God right in front of you. And so we need to rely on Scripture. You won't be a faithful witness. You'll be an easily persuaded coward that's falling victim to the popular sayings and philosophies of the day. But if we hold fast to the things of God, if we hold fast to the word of the Lord, then we're like a man that builds his house on the rock, right? Because we have our foundation. We have uh, a, a firm foundation. Application or thought number two is this. Christians that build their lives on the truths of Scripture will attempt great things on behalf of Scripture. Christians that see the commands in Scripture to go and reach the world with the message of the gospel and take those commands seriously, will risk life, limb, material goods, material happinesses to reach people with the gospel. We as students of the word, we're not going to settle for what Bonhoeffer referred to as cheap grace. We're not, we're not settling for the bare minimum. We're going to take the word of God, and we're going to do great things on behalf of the God that inspires it. We will see the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf, and we're going to take up our cross, and we're going to follow him wherever he tells us to go. John Owen, he wrote uh, this. He says, The exposition and application of the word by many, and that by virtue of an extraordinary assistance of the Spirit of God, was of singular use in the church itself. For if all Scripture given by inspiration from God, so expounded and applied, 
be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, the more the church enjoyeth it, the more will its faith, love, obedience, and consolation be increased. That is a Puritan talk for the greater our love for Scripture, the greater our desire to reach people with the Scripture. That's what it means for us as Christians to attempt great things on behalf of the gospel. The Bible reveals man's great need for God, and the more we are in love with this book, the more we will love the God that has inspired it, and the more that we love the God of Scripture, the greater our love will be for those that are created in his image. You see, the greater our reliance on Scripture, the greater our desire for sharing the truth of those Scriptures will be. The content of this book is so precious. It is so precious to so many people. Like, we we don't even think of it. I'll be honest. I wish we were persecuted more. Like, I wish in a way, I'm glad that we're not. I wish in a way that we had this, this pressure to dive into the book. Like, we're not meeting under the cover of darkness. You can go to the store and buy a Bible and nobody's going to kill you. But around the world, that is a possibility. That is, and, and, and here's the thing. People gladly in these places gather to hear the word of God. And I wish we were, were like that. Like, like, I think we've gotten so spoiled with, with religious freedoms that we can often forget about people that don't have that same freedom. But guess what? Where those places are, where that persecution is real, uh, you, you, you know this. The joy in the hearts of those believers is real. When they hear the word of God, it is precious to them. And this goes right in to application number three, that the Christian that loves scripture will be satisfied. They will be overjoyed. This is why David says in verse 11, Moreover by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Everything that you need to know in life in order to be truly satisfied is in the word of God. The Bible might not give you everything that you want in life, but it will give you everything you need in life in order to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So what this means is that, uh, you know, if you take your Bible into McDonald's and you open it up and say, God, what am I going to order today? There's not going to be a verse in there that says, thou shalt order a Big Mac. You're not going to find that there. But what it will say is, hey, here's how you can glorify me and enjoy me forever. That's healthier than a Big Mac. That's better than than any earthly riches. So J.C. Ryle, he said that the true Christian is the only happy man because he has sources of happiness entirely independent of the world. And so what I would ask you guys is, are you happy? Like, are you happy? And I, and I don't mean, do you have, have moments of happiness? Everyone has at least one second in the day where they're probably less miserable than they were at any other moment. Do you have true joy in your heart? True everlasting happiness cannot be found anywhere outside of God and his word. Christians that are in love with the word of God will be satisfied because they see through the word of God that true satisfaction can only be found in Christ. Christ says in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If the supreme source of our satisfaction in this life is the Lord, he himself will make sure that our satisfaction is met. How do we hunger for more of God? How do we thirst for more of him? Well, the answer is what we've been going through is by, by hungering for his word, by diving into scripture, by being in love with the Bible. And then one last thing, the last application is this. A high view of scripture reminds the Christian of God's glory. Isaiah 42, 21 says, The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. The word of God is glorious because the God that inspired it is infinitely glorious. When you look at the Bible, do you see the infinite glorious nature of God that is behind it? Do you see the supreme worth of Christ? These pages are the, it's the book of life. The words of God are coming through these pages. And so John Piper, he has this really book, good book called, uh, I think it's Reading the Bible Supernaturally. And it's not like, it's not like this like Pentecostal kind of like, you know, supernatural, let's speak the tongues sort of thing. Uh, no, nah, if you know John Piper, he ain't about that life. Um, but this is what he says in the book. He says, we should always read God's word in order to see his supreme worth and beauty, his glory. In other words, I'm not only saying that seeing the glory of God does happen in reading God's word. I am also saying that this should always be our aim in reading the Bible. There may be a hundred practical reasons, good ones, that we turn to God's word. This aim should be in and under and over all of them, always. 
God is magnified when we are love in love with his word. Here's the thing. When I read the Bible, I don't want to read it like I'm just reading any other book. I don't want to read it like, uh, you know, uh, I'm just kind of going through these pages. I just got to meet a quota, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not reading this book like a textbook. My hope is when I read my Bible, Jesus is going to pop out of the book and he's going to punch me in the face in a good way, holy and righteous. Got a good, good right hook. Uh, that's what I want. When I dive into the book, I'm, I'm not just wanting to cross things off my to-do list. I want to read my Bible so that I can know God. I want my heart to be so captivated by his word that the thought of not having it just, just breaks me. If your Bible was gone, would that break you? If your Bible just didn't exist, what, what, what would you do? Christians that hold fast to Scripture alone are Christians that want to know the God who is there. When you read your Bible, do you get a taste of God's glory? Do you see the infinite worth of the God of Scripture? And I'm hoping that you do because I think that a lot of us might be guilty of just reading the Word to say that we read it and not so that we can see God's glory in these pages. I don't want to just read about God. I want to know God. I want to see God. I want to be in love with his word that I, so that I can find him on every line of scripture, on every single page. As we close up this morning, my prayer for you is that you hold fast to the word of God. I'll, I'll kind of throw this in too. Without the Holy Spirit in your life, you won't be able to carry out the four applications that we went through this morning. If, if, you, if you have not been saved by the, the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ, then the four things that we just went over this morning aren't going to do you much good. The Holy Spirit needs to work in your life so that you can carry out what we have talked about this morning. So if you're not following Christ, this book will not mean to you what it has meant to centuries of believers around the world. So if we want to be satisfied, it starts with knowing the Lord and it starts with knowing his word. If we don't know him, we as the church, we would love to introduce you to him because he has done amazing things in, in, in my life and in the life that I know so many other people here. Um, we want to introduce you to the Lord if you don't know him because he is beautiful, he is righteous, he's good, and he has breathed out this word to us. You see, the world that we live in today is not that much different than the world of Martin Luther 500 years ago. The spiritual ground of man is dry, but the fountains of God's words continue to overflow. And so what we need to do as we leave here this morning is we need to go with a commitment to run to the well that does not run dry, to run to his word and just be inspired and just build up by the beauty and majesty of God in scripture. And as we see him come to life in his word, we're going to see it in everything that we do around us. So I'm going to pray. Um, I'll be in the back. If you have anything we can pray for you about, we would love to pray with you. Um, but I'm going to pray and then we'll worship together as we conclude our service. Let's pray. God, you are a God of infinite joy, of infinite majesty and wonder. You have revealed yourself beautifully in your word, and you have just, in your grace, you have given it to us. We were not entitled to your word. We're not entitled to the book of God. We're not entitled to scripture, but in your mercy, you've given it to us. Let us not lose sight of your infinite majesty that you have revealed to us in your word. Help us to love you and to value the sacrifice of your son above all else so that we can go and tell others about it. In all of this we pray, amen.
Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful to be here, to have the freedom to worship you and read your word. God, I just pray that we are each touched by your spirit, that we will continue to delve into your word and study that verse for 10 minutes and let us speak to our heart, Father God, that we may share your love and kindness. God, I just pray blessings over the congregation till we meet again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 